but I may not because I'm a host. There we go. And if you want to give your disclaimer one more time, just to make sure we also yes. have it on a recording, that'd be sweet. Just officially speaking, uh, the things you're going to hear today are for your information and to help you to research some more about medicinal plants, not only the history of them, the history of use for people in general, but also um, you need to check with your doctor before you try any of these things. If you find out through this process that you're allergic to something or you have a really bad reaction, and you didn't do your research, we, and in any case, we're not responsible for that. We just want you to have this information to help you encourage, uh, to be encouraged to develop a closer relationship with what we called our plant allies, our wild allies last week. Um, Madeline, if you're ready to go, I will hush up and let you take the floor. Great, I'm ready. All right. um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, we good? We can see it? Great. Yep. Okay, welcome again to um, part two of Native Plants, Pollinators, and Medicinal Plants, or Wild Allies. Thanks, Erin, for that lovely introduction. Um, just a final reminder while we get started here, go ahead and mute yourselves if you haven't already. Thank you so much. Um, great. Today we are talking about medicinal plants, mainly medicinal herbs. Um, we are going to talk about why, why do we want to grow medicinal plants? What are the benefits? We'll talk about medicinals that we can grow here in Kentucky. We will talk about a little bit about how we use medicinals, how we can use what we're growing in our garden. Um, we will touch on foraging for medicinals as well. Um, I couldn't help not. Uh, it's kind of a different subject, but there's a lot of great spring plants popping up right now that we can go into our backyards and forage for. Um, and then again, also just kind of why, why medicinals, but I just wanted to touch on, um, you know, I started getting interested in using medicinal herbs because I was dealing with health issues and wasn't getting the attention or the um, plans, preventative plans that I needed from doctors. Um, so I, I started taking medicinal herbs and found a lot of solace in a lot of them. Um, and then after that started growing some of them. Um, using medicinals is a different way of interacting with medicine. Um, it's very different than the way that we're used to popping ibuprofen or taking pharmaceuticals that oftentimes overrule our body's natural timeline to heal itself. Um, so when we're taking medicinals, it's just kind of a whole, it's a new mindset. Um, and I think we can get, it's easy to get caught up in comparing them to a lot of um, drugs that we're used to taking, or even a lot of just modalities that we, we use in the Western world to support our, our bodies. Um, so it's important that we take our time when we use medicinal herbs, that we uh, really notice how herbs are interacting with our bodies, um, that we uh, you know, use our research and our intuition um, together to kind of support this new um, discovery. Uh, and also using medicinal herbs just serves as a great way to have more awareness of your body, of what you're experiencing and kind of, uh, you know, you're, you know your body the best, you know, better than any doctor, you know, better than, than anyone, you know your body. And I think that it can be a really empowering thing to use these herbs to treat ourselves um, with other healthcare professionals um, to, to learn about ourselves and our bodies. And again, I'm not a medical professional or licensed clinician. I'm not even an herbalist. I'm just a person who likes to grow herbs and wanna share a little bit of this with you. So 
please, please talk to your doctors and any healthcare professionals um, while before you are uh, going on your herb journey. Okay. Um, I am wondering if anyone knows what this plant is. I've never taught an herb class without plants before. So I tried to pick some really nice pictures so that we can all look at these plants together. Um, does anyone have any idea what this is? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself real quick. Great, I'm happy to tell you. This is a uh, Tulsi or holy basil. Um, you'll see this plant. This plant is uh, in all the health food stores. Um, we can get packaged teas. It is a mint, yes. Yeah, it is in the mint family. Um, so it's a pretty common medicinal herb um, and it's incredibly easy to grow. And it is the one herb that I encourage you, if you don't grow anything else from today, it's the one thing I encourage you to grow. It's very easy to grow, grows just like basil. Its nickname is uh, holy basil. Um, so it'll make you feel like a pro uh, and it makes really delicious tea, summertime tea. So um, that's the, the one thing I encourage you to grow from today. Um, so um, why are we growing medicinals? Um, a lot of medicinal plants are also pollinators, which are great to have in our gardens. A lot of them are perennial in our climate, um, so there's maybe less succession or turnover of, uh, in comparison to a lot of vegetables. So a lot of these plants, you plant them once and then uh, you have them for several years. Um, so there's uh, less maintenance often for a lot of these plants. Um, a lot of them have essential oils and aromas that deter pests, which is great if we are also uh, growing vegetables or anything that, you know, the insects want to get into. And a lot of them just generally go undisturbed by, yeah, any other kind of critter um, or insect. A lot of them uh, have a lot of resiliency um, in that area. So, and also, uh, to demystify what medicinal herbs are, you are probably already growing medicinals. A lot of our culinary herbs are also medicinal herbs. Um, they all have a lot of great medicinal constituents inside of them, often a lot of nutrients inside of them. So herbs like rosemary, thyme, sage, oregano, parsley, mint, dill, marjoram, basil, there are more. We have a nice uh, botanical illustration of oregano plant up there too. Um, and if you want to experiment with some medicinal herb uh, remedies, you can, I think Erin was saying last week, she served one of her kids some thyme tea. I think that's what you said, Erin. Um, and it took away their cough. Yes, um, that's right. Um, he was coughing pretty heavily and I just sat with him and, and, and as Madeline mentioned, like it does take time, but it was, I think, both giving him the tea and sitting with him while he drank it and the tea itself that sort of was, had a calming effect. Yeah, so we can try this with things we're already growing. I love rosemary tea. Um, just boil your water like you would for any regular tea, throw some rosemary in there, let it steep for a few minutes, um, and you have a nice soothing uh, medicinal remedy. So I'm going to start off talking about, uh, I'm going to go through a few plants here. Some of them you will probably already know, some of them might already even be in your garden, and I hope to introduce you to a couple that you're less familiar with as well. Um, so we'll go through a series of, I think, about 10 plants um, that we can add to our garden uh, that all have medicinal uh, components to them. Um, the first is chamomile. Uh, I think we all have had chamomile tea before. Um, I will tell you if you haven't had fresh chamomile or homegrown chamomile or local chamomile that's organic, you haven't had chamomile tea. It's incredibly different. It's basically like eating a canned tomato versus a you know, summer garden tomato. That's the difference. 
Um, so it's a it's a lovely thing to grow. Um, it's very it's very achievable, very possible for us to grow in our garden. Um, when you are getting seeds, you want to make sure to get a German or common chamomile, not Roman chamomile. Um, the Roman is more of like a ground covering that doesn't really flower as much. Um, the common or German grows more upright um, and has tiny little flowers on it that you can pluck off and harvest for tea or whatever you want to do with them. Um, it does like full sun or partial shade. It is. It doesn't really love the heat. So if you want to grow it in the summer, it's best to do so in shade. Um, and it likes well draining, more sandy soil. Um, something that I like to do with chamomile is I plant it in the fall, um, which allows it to come up earlier in the spring, to flower earlier, and then I have a little bit more time, a little more harvest time um, with the chamomile before it gets too hot. Um, you can also, if you start seeds, you can also start um, multiple seeds in a cell. Um, and they don't need to be thinned out. So multiple plants uh, can be transplanted together, um, if that makes sense. So you can have one cell with a bunch of seeds in it, all of them can sprout up, and then you can take that transplant and you can plug that right into the garden. Um, they're, they're pretty dainty, feathery uh, plants, their stems and their leaves. So you can put them quite close together too. Um, it's an annual in our climate, and it definitely will self-seed if it likes the soil that it's in. Um, we all know chamomile is calming. Um, it soothes our digestion. Um, and so that's that's its main the main thing that it's often used for. Um, it can also be used externally as well. Um, and again, when we're harvesting, we're picking the flowers. Um, you, and you can just pluck them off of the stem. Um, there's also really fancy chamomile rakes that I have a picture of, you'll see, um, that are used to harvest them on, on farms, usually, and things like that. Calendula, calendula um, is the next plant. Um, it's also known as pot marigold. And I originally thought that was because it grew in a pot. You could gr grow it in a pot, which you can, but it was called that because it was often put into broths. Um, so people would boil this plant in water with other herbs. Um, that's how it got its name. Um, you're probably, this is a pretty popular plant. You're probably familiar with it just because it's beautiful. Um, it has a, we have a picture coming up. It has just, it's orange and like loud and vibrant and and um, when you touch it, it has this like really beautiful like resiny uh, that come resin that comes off of it, um, and it is used a lot externally in like skin care products. Um, it has a lot of anti-inflammatory properties for the skin. Um, it does like full sun, and it doesn't need a ton of water, um, so it's pretty easy to grow. It will produce flowers all summer long. Uh, it is an annual in our climate and a perennial in um, Mediterranean or Southern European climates. It can grow into like a large bush um, in its native climates. Um, and it is a great vegetable companion uh, plant. People use it along with marigolds to keep away pests. You, oh, also a great use uh, other than externally is that it moves lymph in our system. So it gets all of those toxins out, um, which can be really great. I made myself a tea this morning that has chamomile and calendula and some yarrow too, which we'll talk about. Um, I really ha like having that mix in the morning, even though chamomile is uh, calming. Um, I actually like having that sometimes when I when I'm feeling a little you know anxious or stim overstimulated or something. It's kind of nice to have that mix in there. Um, harvest we use the flowers. We just pluck them right off of the stem like chamomile, um, and you can open the you can pluck them when the blooms have fully opened or even if they're half opened. 
Um, but once they're big and they're open, you want to pluck them off before they start getting dry um, and, and sort of are browning a little bit. Madeline, a question in the chat yeah. for both flowers is, do you need to dry them um, after you pick them or can you use them fresh? How does that work? Both. both. Yeah, both. Um, and like I said, the, that fresh chamomile and the calendula too, but there's, there's nothing like it. So the dried flower, I have some dried, actually I have both of these here. This is some dried chamomile, which you've seen before, but if you've only bought things from in a tea bag, you know, it's, um, it looks different. Um, you can actually tell it's a flower. Um, but the fresh, really, the flavor is, is a lot different too. And the medicinal properties will just be uh, heightened, you know, when it's fresh. Um, there's some calendula. And then there's the, that's our chamomile, the chamomile rake, super fun. And there's our calendula. Um, and both of these look like, you know, more production uh, spots, maybe less home garden spots, but I think that gives you a pretty good idea of what it looks like. Um, and really, I think all of the herbs I'm talking about today, you can use them fresh or dried. Okay, echinacea is one that we are pretty familiar with. Um, it is a perennial in our climate. Um, so, you know, grows pretty slow at first. I like the little uh, rhyme. First year they sleep, second year they creep, third year they leap. That's my little perennial um, rhyme to remember, kind of how the, their growing pattern is those first couple of years. Um, echinacea wants partial or full sun, and it will tolerate poor soil, but not wet soil. Um, this is a native plant, often we'll see it out in the world. Um, so it is, it is pretty easy to grow. Um, we use it as an immune booster. Um, it has alkalamides that uh, sort of um, make our mouths tingle and can serve as a numbing component for our mouths. That's mainly contained in the root. Um, we do use all parts of this plant. We use um, the flowers, the cones, the petals, the leaves, and the roots. Um, it's also used to treat colds, sore throats, fevers, um, any kind of like flu symptom. Um, and we, we've probably all taken this. It comes in pills and tinctures and a million different ways. There's a million different ways you can get it at the health food store. Um, when we are harvesting, like I said, we use all parts. Um, in years one and two, we want to use the leaves and the flowers. After year three, we can dig up the roots, which is where the majority of the um, medicinal constituents are. Um, if we are in year one or two and we just want to cut the top of the plant, or if we're in year five or six, whatever, and you just you don't want to dig it up, um, you mainly, and this is the rule of thumb for a lot of these plants, um, you want to harvest the top two thirds of the plant. So you want to leave one third of the plant in the ground so that it can continue to grow. And a lot of these plants too will give you more than one flush per season. So you might be able to harvest in July and then come back in September and harvest again. Uh, yarrow um, is also a native. We can, we'll see that out in the world as well. It loves full sun, well-drained so soil. It likes it to be hot and dry. It is a perennial. Um, all of these things make it pretty easy to grow. Um, for use, um, energetically, yarrow is often used as a plant that uh, helps us to uh, have boundaries um, and sort of a protective plant. Um, it is effective for internal and external blood issues. Um, so if you needed to move blood, it would be helpful. If you needed to stop blood, it would be helpful. It has an inherent intelligence that kind of knows what your body needs. 
Um, it's used for pain relief for some kinds of pain and also for fever reduction. Um, I got a, I had some yarrow in my garden a couple of years ago and I got a gash. I like ran into the side of a greenhouse and I got a gash in my leg that wasn't wide, but it was pretty deep. And I ran out into the field and I plucked some yarrow flowers off of a plant and I stuck it onto my bleeding wound. And I swear to you before my eyes, my skin, just completely sutured itself. Um, so we can use the leaves and the flowers of this plant fresh or dried to help um, treat wounds. Um, you do have to be careful because it is so effective that you have to make sure that the wound is very clean, that it's going to set properly, um, or else it could set in a way that you don't want it to. Um, so that, that was the one time when I was like, wow, this is really, this is actually plant magic. Like it looked like it was, uh, you know, a computerized thing happening on my leg. This wound just closed up immediately. So pretty cool. There's echinacea. And there's yarrow. Yarrow comes in all different colors. We really... And there are a lot of beliefs that this color is good for pregnancy and this color is good, will give you energy. I just use the white. It has the highest medicinal properties. Um, so I, I recommend growing the white if you want to use it medicinally. But it's fun to look into the other things too, if you're interested in that. Passionflower. Um, this is also native. Um, it has other names like maypop, passion fruit, passion vine. It trellises. It doesn't have to, but a most effective way to grow it is to trellis it on something. Um, the seeds often want or need stratification, which is a prolonged period of where the seed is cold, is kept cold and moist. You can do that with a paper towel in the refrigerator wetting a paper towel and putting seeds in it and then putting that in the refrigerator or the freezer. <clears throat> you can just sow them in the fall and they will go through that cold winter period. Um, some of these seeds also want scarification, which is it, the out, outermost seed coating wants to be nicked a little um, to help it to germinate. Um, <clears throat> I've also germinated this without doing any of that, <laughs> um, but but I think those are techniques if you're having a hard time germinating them. Often you'll see that on seed packets. So I still think it's worth a shot. You'll probably have a lower germination rate if you don't do any of those things, but you may still get um, a couple of, of plants if you sowed a whole package, a whole packet. Um, and it's also perennial, it flowers in the second year. Um, we use it as a slight sedative. It's calming to our minds. It treats insomnia and lessens certain types of pains. Um, we're harvesting the flowers and the leaves, and then also it will fruit. Um, Skullcap is um, a really effective herb, one that I take frequently um, for anxiety or nervous tension. Um, or if I'm, you know, feeling a little too hyped and again, overstimulated, I'll take some, um, I find it really calming. Um, I took some this morning. Um, it likes partial shade or full sun and wants to be watered moderately, um, especially after it's harvested. Um, it is a perennial and growing it from seed can be tricky because it really changes shape and color a lot um, as it's establishing and maturing. Um, so if you put it out into your garden early, I would recommend marking it um, so you know exactly which plant it is. Um, again, we use it as a mild sedative therapy for anxiety and nervous tension. Um, and sort of that rule of thumb, top two thirds rule of thumb goes for this. We're harvesting the leaves and the purple flowers. It's passion flower. 
Again, we'll use that flower and we'll use the leaves as well. And that's skull cap. And again, we'll use the flower in the leaves. Motherwort um, is another incredible herb. Um, it is a perennial. It wants full, full sun or light shade. It grows in moist soils. I've used this because I have heart arrhythmia. Um, and so it actually helps to regulate my heartbeat. Um, and it does, it can do a lot of, if you have different kinds of heart um, issues, it can, it has an intelligence that can act to, um, to, to regulate your system. Um, it's also a slight sedative. Um, people, folks also take it to relieve menopause symptoms. Um, I've also taken it for like PMS symptoms as well. Um, I've also just taken it if, if I want to chill out, uh, I'll make some other wort tea. Um, it is in the mint family. This plant is like stunning to see. It's beautiful. Um, and it has sort of a thorny, there's like thorns, a little like tiny thorns on the stem, um, which make it even more enchanting in my opinion. There's the picture of motherwort. I wanted to show how large it is. It's as tall as that person. Um, and then on the other side, I just wanted to give you a better idea of what it looks like. And again, we harvest the top two thirds of that and we're using the leaves and the flowers. Valerian, um, this is probably one, that, this is maybe you've heard of this one as well. Um, we, it's in a lot of like sleepy time teas um, and a lot of like uh, tinctures that help you to sleep or pills that help, will help you to sleep. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, it works too good for a lot of people. Um, so again, like with all of these herbs, we are doing research, we're using our intuition, we are witnessing what it feels like in our own bodies. It's gonna be different from person to person. It wants full sun or partial shade, and it wants to be in well-draining soil, but kept moist. Um, it is a perennial and will die back completely in the winter. Um, used to treat insomnia, anxiety, depression, PMS, headaches. Um, we are not using, you can use the flowers of this, but they're kind of stinky. Um, so, and they don't have the highest medicinal quality. Um, we are using the roots. So after year three, we can dig up the roots on this plant. Um, and we can use those for teas or tinctures. Um, and that, that's where the majority of the, of the medicinal constituents are. There's our mother word again. And there's our valerian. It's also very tall. Okay, got a couple more. I think these are the last two herbs and then we'll talk about some other stuff. Um, ashwagandha um, is also has been like a popular herb in the last few years. I think there's a lot of like powders, people make it into pills. Um, these are both, both of these herbs are plants that are used in Ayurveda and in um, Indian culture, um, and specifically Tulsi is used in Hindu religion. Um, ashwagandha is one of my favorite things to grow. Um, it is, it does get attacked by flea beetles. This is kind of the only, oh, there it is. I didn't mean to press that, but there it is. Um, there's the root and then there's a berry and, and the leaf of it too. And we're using the root. Um, but it does get attacked by flea beetles, so you do have to spray it with neem oil, or you just have to keep it covered with row cover um, for this season. 
Um, and if you don't do either of those, you'll still get plants. They just won't be as big as, as they maybe could have been. Um, it grows like a tomato. It's in the, night, in the nightshade family. Um, but we do not want to eat the leaves or the berries. The berries are a little toxic to us. Um, and it is an annual. Um, it is a in this category of herbs called um, adaptogens, which um, are herbs that we that are good for us to take frequently. The more that we take them, the more that our body will um, store up its ability to use them effectively. And they basically make us more resilient. They help our bodies to be able to endure more stress um, than, we, than we potentially could. Um, so they expand our capacities to kind of take on stress and to be more resilient through that. Um, and, and both of these herbs are in that category. So they're unlike some of the other ones where like, it's not gonna put you to sleep. It's not gonna calm you down. It's not gonna give you a little like, a, like a little stimulation. It's just going to kind of rack up in your system over time and expand that, that stress, um, taking on stress capacity. Um, and we're again, are harvesting the root of this and that's just dug up. Um, it is an annual, so that's dug up at the end of the growing season. And Tulsi um, that I talked about at the beginning, it grows like basil, will make you feel like a master gardener. It can really take all kinds of growing condi conditions, um, but it does prefer full sun and water. Um, and it is another adaptogen. These two plants are, are very different in their qualities. So one might be a better um, ashwagandha is one that I feel like I, I really benefit from having consistently. Um, Tulsi, um, I really love it, but I don't feel like I need it quite as much. Um, it's a lot more, ashwagandha is a root, so it's very pungent. Um, it's very bitter. Those are the things that my body responds to. Tulsi is a lot more aromatic and oily. Um, so, you know, depending on what your body is, how your body is, one or the other might be, might be more beneficial. Um, but we can use Tulsi every day, and it is a sacred plant um, for Hindus. Um, and a lot of like Indian households, you will see it sort of at the center of the courtyard. Um, it's often prayed to. And um, once this plant Tulsi has flowered, um, we can again cut two thirds of the way down and we can get several harvests out of it in just one season. There's the ashwagandha again. And these roots can be dried and put into a blender to make a powder. They can just be used fresh for a tea or a tincture. And there's the Tulsi again. And there's a Tulsi sort of as it would be displayed in an Indian courtyard. Do we have any questions so far before I go to the next little part? We have a few, yeah. Um, let me pull those up, I've been writing them down. Uh, there was a question about whether or not we needed to grow uh, Tulsi in a container since it's in the mint family. Um, because it's an annual, it won't spread. So it okay. could self seed, but it's not, it, it's not super likely. It doesn't, um, it won't overtake anything. You can grow it in, in a container, but you don't need to fear it spreading. Gotcha. Um, the question about um, the calendula was already answered about whether or not they needed to be dried. And I think the idea was, can you give us a little bit of a hint about how to dry flowers if we get a huge yes. harvest? Can't use them at once, that might be helpful. Um, any way you can dry the flower is a great way to dry the flower. 
Um, I use screens um, and I just have them in my house and I lay everything flat out on the screen. I make sure there isn't a lot of overlap of the plant material. Um, and that just sits in my house for a while. Sometimes it takes a while because we live in a humid climate. Um, if you wanna go a step further, you can get a dehumidifier, you can get a fan, get some air circulating in there. Um, so a screen is a great a way to do that. Um, and I just use like a mesh material and stretch it over like a wood frame. Um, you can also get one of those like, you can use a, um, a what's it called? Do you dryer a um, just like something that you would use for other like food dehydrator? Food dehydrator, yes, you can use a food dehydrator. You can use they make like little racks that hang like mesh racks. You could like hang a little mesh rack in your kitchen. Um, you could, this is maybe a more drier climate thing, but you could put stuff in a paper bag in the back of your like car and you're like where your car windshield is or whatever, the back windshields, because cars are nice like dry and dry usually inside. Um, but you want to make sure you have that in a bag so the sunlight isn't hitting it directly. Um, also so say wherever this is happening, it is good to do it in the shade. And also we, we know when we look at at films, then you're in the herbalist kitchen and there's herbs hanging everywhere. You don't actually mm. want to leave them hanging around so long that that dust starts to collect on them. Mm. <laughs> Once they're dried, go ahead and store them so that you don't have to deal with cleaning them because I'm not sure that's even possible. Um, mm. There's another question about how tall chamomile gets. Um, it could get like, I would say like two to three feet. It could get three feet. Okay. Um, and you answered the question about yellow versus white yarrow. Um, you said that white has more of the medicinal properties. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there I was think yellow is, is actually used to be like more stimulating, which I say that like that because I haven't experienced that. But I think that that's, there, there are certain energetics around the different colors. And I think, that, yeah, that's a thing. Um, there's there's some questions that are sort of borderlining on the the point of medical advice um but we're gonna ask them so we can have that conversation um one is if you're using a an herb consistently such as tulsi or holy basil or um one of those that you can take regularly the question was whether or not it needs to be tested in a lab like if you grew it <clears throat> Um, I, I mean, this is just my opinion, but I, I would say no, um, if you, if, if you feel like you're, if you've had your soil tested and you feel like your soil is fine, um, you know, I think it's, I think that's something that's grown, you know, close to you, um, that you have eyes over, you know, um, I think should be, should actually contain a lot of nutrients. Um, and I, I'm not sure you, it's also like, again, like, I think you're listening to your body. Maybe you, you're experience, experimenting with something for a couple of months and then you take a break and you see if you feel any differently. Um, even with the adaptogens, I think an herbalist would say, take this for three months and then don't take it for a month. So I think there is still break periods. So I think Ruth, the person who asked the question had some clarification. Yeah, it, it, my question was, does it need to be reported when they say, are you taking anything else over the counter? Absolutely. Um, yeah, and this 100%. is where you consult, your, consult your doctor, your medical professional. Um, you are a whole person um, and you want to let them know everything that's going into your body in case there is a um, an adverse effect that they can predict. Um, and I, I, I chose plants intentionally. They're generally very safe, but it's good as you start to incorporate herbs into your diet that you are practicing checking in with, with different people about what you're taking because there are a lot of herbs that are less and less safe. 
Um, the ones that, I, that I'm talking about are very safe, but um, you know, some herbs can be toxic unless they are used to create, to, um, to <clears throat> um, address a very specific uh, physical ailment. So there's a lot of variance in here, you know? So yeah, it's great to check with, with your doctor. The first. other, the other question here is about dosage and sort of where to start with that whole thing. Um, yeah, um, I would start with a cup of tea, you know, so, so keep it small. Um, and it depends on kind of your personal preference of how strong you would want something like that to be or what kind of plant it is. But, um, you know, I would start with even just like three or four sprigs off this Tulsi plant, make your tea, and then just kind of see how you feel and go from there. If you're gonna try something like valerian or motherwort, maybe I would do it in the evening where you're not gonna to have to drive anywhere, you know, in case you really, feel extra relaxed from it. Um, cool. I think that's all the questions for now. Great. Um, we can move on. Um, these are just a couple of different ways, a couple of different ways we can prepare herbs. Um, we can make tinctures, which I'm not going to go into too much. If we have a couple of questions, I'll be happy to answer them. But um, tinctures are basically where you take an herb, or any other medicinal plant, um, you put it into liquid um, that has a high extraction capability. So um, it's gonna take a lot of the medicinal components in the plant and it's going to extract them out of the plant and hold them in the liquid. Often that's done with alcohol, often high proof vodka because vodka won't mask the other flavors of the herbs but you can do it with any alcohol. Um, I use organic cane alcohol, um, which has like kind of the clear. Um, you can also use glycerin if you don't wanna use alcohol. Glycerin is often um, made from palm oil um, and it has a sweet flavor to it. Uh, a lot of times if folks are making tinctures for children or pets, um, they'll use glycerin. Um, I prefer alcohol because glycerin does have that extra sweet flavor, which kind of masks the herb flavor. And it also is sticky. <laughs> so I don't really enjoy making things with it because it kind of gets everywhere, but it is a great uh, alternative if you don't want to use alcohol. Often tinctures also have other liquids besides alcohol incorporated in them, usually water, sometimes apple cider vinegar. Um, that's supposed to say ACV um, or honey uh, to kind of take that edge off if you're using alcohol. It's nice to have a little honey in there. An herbal shrub is a extract that's made with apple cider vinegar and honey and an herb. Um, they're often very delicious. You can add them to waters or sparkling waters or cocktails or whatever. Um, teas, I think we're all familiar with teas. You're putting fresh or dried herbs, sorry about that, into um, near boiling water. And then a decoction is a water extract of an herb. So it's similar to a tea, but you are simmering the plant material for 20, at least 20 minutes. And you're gonna use this for herbs that are roots like the ashwagandha or the valerian um, or anything that has a lot of like resin quality to it or anything that's woody. So if it isn't a um, aromatic oily herb, you're going to prepare it in a decoction rather than a tea. And I wanted to talk really quick about foraging for herbs. 
um, or plants um, because the, the herbal world, the medicinal herb world often oversects with this world. Um, so I just wanted to, to say a couple of things about that. Um, when we're out foraging for plants, we only want to take one in every 10 plant. It's kind of the rule of thumb. Um, we want to pay attention from where we're harvesting from. So we don't want to harvest next to major highways or areas that are really being mowed over. Often there's nothing there anyway, but even like low growing stuff, um, I wouldn't want to take anything from an area that had been mowed on top of. Um, definitely, if you think that the area has been sprayed, we definitely don't wanna take anything from there. Um, we also, again, wanna use our research, our intuition, and we wanna know with 100% certainty that the plant is what we think it is when we are harvesting from the, from the world. So I think Erin mentioned like an app last week that they use to identify plants. We wanna use our apps. We wanna use our field guides. We want to use our intuition and we want to know for sure that what we are harvesting is what we think it is. Um, in this picture, these uh, purpley lavender flowers are wild bergamot or bee balm, um, and we'll see a lot of those this summer. That's something that I, I look forward to harvesting every summer. And these are just a few plants that we can harvest from our area um, that have uh, medicinal or um, other nutritive values. So the wild bergamot that's in this picture, bee balm, St. John's wort, there's lots of chickweed out there right now. The mugwort will be coming out soon. There's lots of dandelions, of course. And this is a good time to harvest those roots. Um, and in the early spring, there's a lot of good medicine in the dandelion roots. It's out there, jewelry, jewelweed, which is a great um, remedy for poison ivy and often growing near poison ivy. Violets, those little purple violets are out right now and are edible. Dead nettle, um, those are everywhere too right now and are not the most delicious, but they're edible. Purslane, one of my favorites that'll be out later in the summer. Goldenrod in the late summer, probably my most favorite. Chicory, you'll see that a lot by roadsides. Um, ironweed, that'll be later in the summer. Curly dock, that's definitely out now. Wild lettuce will be a little later. Cleavers are probably starting. Those are the ones that stick to your clothes. Um, white pine. Lamb's quarters are just as good as spinach, in my opinion. Sumac, we see those a lot um, everywhere. There's a ton out by Red River Gorge. Um, sassafras, been around for a long time as a medicinal um, tree. Stinging nettle. We'll see those around sometimes in the forests, those grow in more um, shadier areas. And then our very beloved elderberry, which is one that we can grow too. A lot of people grow elderberry. And just a couple of resources. Um, if you're looking for seeds and plants, um, for a lot of herb seeds, I go to Prairie Moon Nursery and Strictly Medicinals. Um, there's a local woman who runs a business called The Herb Shack, and she sometimes has uh, plant starts. I think that there, I think I looked at her website recently and she said that she would have some stuff later in April. So if you wanna check in with her about herb starts, I think she, she either used to or still goes to the Douglas Loop Farmer's Market. Um, there's Taproot Nursery, <clears throat> which is out towards Lexington, um, but they have medicinal herb starts. Um, and True Love Seeds is another seed company out of Philadelphia that has a lot of great herbs. 
Um, and then there are a couple of local herbalists, um, Michelle G at 13 Moons Apothecary. You can Google that. She has a great website. Um, she has some products and she's also um, an herbalist. And Myron Hardesty, who's been around for a very long time, um, his business, Weeds of Eden, um, he does a lot of herbal um, consultations through that business. Um, and he does have some, some plants as well. Um, and he, he will make remedies for folks. Uh, and then there's Among the Oaks, which is an herb farm out near the Red River Gorge. Um, they have some really incredible products, uh, teas, powders, tinctures. Um, so yeah, support your local herb farm or grow your herbs or both. Do we have any more questions? <clears throat> um, it doesn't appear that we do. Uh, while you were talking, I did find my holy basil seed packets and I'm ready to go feel nice. like a master gardener because yeah. I don't know how to read the back of the seed packet. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to go ahead and talk about the classes that are upcoming? Yes. I did just find out that the chicken class is full. Um, which is the one on the fourth. So we still ha still have room at our uh, city goats class, which is I believe so. April mm -hmm. eighth, which is a Friday. Looks like Bethany just put the link to sign up for the goat class in the chat. Um, there was also a link that uh, M put in there about uh, yarrow. She purchased some last year, and so she put the link that she used to purchase her yarrow in there as well. Um, I did notice that my arrow is coming up in the front and it seems pretty resilient to the frost, which I think is always so amazing. Um, Y'all, if you have any other questions, do you want to, you can type them in the chat or you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, ask them. Okay. I will see at least 12 of you on the 4th. <laughs> 